have uh, some some local Minnesota wildlife for you. Uh, we have the uh, uh, American Red Start, uh, just uh, a cute little bird to start off with. Have the uh, white cabbage butterfly, uh, enjoying some some lavender, perhaps. I'm not sure what the flower is. Uh, these are eastern kingbirds. I think they look. Uh, fancy and, and formal uh, with their, their black and white uh, plumage. And these are, uh, were taken uh, here on campus. Uh, and then we have the frilatary butterfly. That's not a bird. Well, well observed, Christian. Nothing gets past you. Um, then we have the, the green heron, a kind of one of the, the smaller herons but like other herons, kind of will sit motionless, staring at the water, waiting for something to go by that it can snap up. Um, and indeed looks pretty green in the right light. Uh, we also have the, the monarch butterflies that migrate through, uh, through Minnesota. Um, and of course the rabbits that uh, you see uh, everywhere, every, every lawn seems to have at least one. Uh, the uh, red, Headed woodpecker, aptly named. Uh, this one lives at the Nurse Strand uh, Big Woods south of here. Uh, and finally, some wood duck ducklings uh, climbing on each other, I guess, uh, in uh, Golden Valley, a town west of Minneapolis. Those are ducklings. These are ducklings. I mean, more, I guess, they're juveniles in the sense that these are not adult. Ducks, but yes, they're not. They're not. They were not just hatched. They're they're robust. Um, all right. What questions do you have about? Uh, yeah, hey. uh, I'm not sure if you went over this already, but are you going to be requiring masks starting on Wednesday? Good question. So I have heard that there will be like further guidance or something from the college between now and Wednesday. Um, but based on what they have sent out so far, masks will be optional in this class. I will not be wearing a mask, but we'll see if anything changes between now and Wednesday. And so I'll, I'll make a, a final determination on, on Monday. We'll see what, what the college does. Uh, other questions? Okay. I have a question. So in the lab, and uh, I'm able to keep like down the limit, but also this is variable. So like if I use the variable, it comes with just like the number of, of things that I use in the variable. So like if I just we have the variable, then like double, like you say I use the number of times. So assigning a variable I don't think counts as not. No, no, I mean, uh, say I have an expression. Like, Mm -hmm. Expression and something. An expression is a variable. Then it's two of the things. If I use just a variable, it two, but if I use like just wait. Um, yeah, I, I think I see what you're uh, what you're saying. Are, are you asking is that allowed? Uh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Anything that the uh, the uh, DLC checker says is is okay is uh, is okay. Silas, did you have a question? No. Yeah. Um, from the last question, it mentions that you should have a one in the highest or the lowest. Um, is it the most significant or the lowest significant? Right? Are you talking about the power of two? Power of two? Um, yes, so this is getting at the point that if we, like if we write out our powers of two, two, four, a 16. But, but like when I tried it doing that, it said it was an error because they didn't want to be expected one to be the power of two. But two um, oh, yes. So, yes, that, that advice is. Yeah, I just said the wrong thing in the advice. So, yeah, two, two to the zero, yes, would give me one. So, the, it will consider the power of two. Um, but the the thing about, about these is that if we look at the bits, uh, 
all of these powers of 2 are just a single one and everything else is zeros. The only thing this wouldn't apply to is our maximum negative number, since negative numbers are not considered a power of 2. Um, yeah. um, so when I use a uh, bitwise operator not on the uh, mean value, it would raise the uh, warning about are you sure you want to do that, but that's okay, right? Um, yeah, yeah, the, the it, <coughs> compiler warnings, uh, I mean, always, th there's a good reason why it gives that warning, um, but yes, if, if your solution raises a warning but produces the right error for this lab, that's fine. Other questions? Yeah? I haven't seen any questions on that any functions that have floating point arguments. Did I just not see them? Um, so, no, this lab does not include any. Oh, okay. Any plus, the instructions talked about them. Oh, well, that was, in previous there years, there has been a floating point question. Um, not this year, so I just messed up in, in editing the write-up. Other questions? All right, so let's pick up where we left off. But first, don't go to sleep. All right. So at the end of last time, uh, as we were talking about assembly, we were looking at this swap example. We had this function swap, took two pointers, used them to switch the values uh, that each of them pointed to, and I wanted to look at, okay, how does this C code get compiled into assembly? As you remember, the compiler turns C code into assembly, and then the assembler turns this text assembly into the machine code, into the ones and zeros that our CPU actually wants. One thing the compiler is deciding is which registers are going to, are going to be used to implement the different variables or, or hold the values involved in the C code. So if we walk through this sort of step by step. The swap procedure is called. And uh, let's say it's called with, uh, uh, we pass in two, two pointers. Uh, RDI holds address 120. RSI holds address 100. And then we can look in memory here and see, okay, it's 456 is stored at address 100, 123 at address 120. And as we go line by line, we have our first kind of uh, uh, assembly instruction. Uh, and this is the, the move instruction. from the source to the destination. It's not going to modify the source at all. And as I've written it here, it says move Q in the swap code. But it won't always be Q. There are different, uh, different specifiers that can go with uh, assembly instructions, not just move, uh, but others as well, uh, that are going to tell us what the size of the data we are working with. So if we are going to copy data from the source to the destination, and in our t0 equals star xp, we're dereferencing a pointer, going to memory at that address, and copying data from there into our local variable t0. But just given the, the address, which is what is stored in the register, just given uh, hex 120, we don't know 
what it is that is stored at, at address 120. We don't know how many bytes we need to copy from there to somewhere else to do this move. And so our data size specifier is an extra letter that we add on to an assembly instruction to specify how much data we are copying from one place to another, or uh, if it's an arithmetic instruction, kind of how much, uh, how many bytes we are we are reading or writing at the, the source or destination. So we have four different specifiers, and their names are historical from the earliest days of x86. So we have originally we had two. We had W for word, and that says read or write two bytes. And we had B, for read or write one byte. So if I said move W, percent AX, percent BX. This would say move two bytes from the AX register to the BX register. And if we jump back to the chart of registers, remember that within our RAX register, there is a register called AX that refers to just the lowest two bytes of that register. And so uh, the data size specifier will match the size of the operand. So if we're moving two bytes, we'd use the two byte names for the registers. So once we got 32-bit uh, x86, we had L, for long word, and that says read or write four bytes. And then when we got 64 bit, we got Q for quad word, which says read or write eight bytes. And so when we, in the swap assembly code, see move Q, that's saying copy eight bytes from the address stored in RDI to the register RAX. Yes? Why eight instead of four? So if we look at the C code for swap, these are not integers, they're longs. And I deliberately made them longs uh, so that it would use the, the eight byte names for everything. Other questions? Chris? Suppose you specified a, a size specifier less than eight bytes, how would it know which eight bytes to take from the source? Is this like the first amount specified? Yeah, so if we have um, yeah, we say move one byte, and in parentheses we say percent RDI. This parentheses says go to memory. So we just go to whatever that address is and read the one byte thing, 
versus if this was in the queue, we'd be the eight bytes starting at whatever address it is. Uh, and then let's say the rest of this was we were the the destination would have to be um, uh, a one byte register uh, of some kind, say percent data. And I almost was going to say, well, we would move from some place in memory to another place, but this is something that x86 does not actually support. That the move instruction can't do memory to memory move. Basically, always moving into a register intermediate. So, It does not support memory to memory, so you would, you would never see both uh, both the source and destination, and destination being something in parentheses. One of them will, will always need to be. Um, uh, they both can't be the this kind of pointer dereference. And so we've seen in terms of what can be these operands to move. We've seen that okay, we can name a specific register. As, as a destination, we can name a specific register as a source. We can take the value of the register and, and dereference it, go to memory at that address. We can also uh, move literal values. So if if I have the C code x equals 10, then, and let's say I'm going to use percent rdx or x, compiler decides that, then, and maybe this is an int, then I would see move l, move 4 bytes, we're dealing with an int, and my destination is going to be percent rdx, and my source will be the literal number 10. And in assembly, literal numerical values are preceded by a dollar sign. So you might say move dollar sign 10 to rdx, which means move the literal integer value 10 into RDX, you could also see this in hex. So it would be exactly the same to say move hex A to RDX. What are your questions on this? Who is it? So like, uh, to zero being early, I, this is kind of random. Yeah, uh, so the compiler will decide what registers are used for what, and I, as the compiler, decided on some particular RDI will be XP and, and so on. Okay. So when you use the literal, um, does it, like, is it just expected the max would size, or would it replace the entire register, or like if you were just to move like two bits, it would just replace like first? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. When we move the literal value, like does it overwrite the whole register or only part of it? Um, so one, I realized that I is not quite right because I'm moving four bytes, but I use the eight byte register names. And so we would be using the EDX because that's the four byte, the 32 bit name for this register. And 
it will, if we, if we move a quad into a register, it's going to override all eight bytes because that's all there is. If we move a long word, it will write to the first four and zero out the other four. So. Anyone, by zero, I just mean write zeros to those bits. If we move two or one byte, that will not affect the rest of the rest. That will only affect. The, those one or two bytes. So it is not actually consistent. And it's not consistent because this architecture has been accumulating features since 1978. And different people have been making decisions at different times to support different kinds of backwards compatibility. So this is, this is the world we live in. It's exciting. Other questions? Yeah, Tom. You mentioned that you set them to DX rather than EDX earlier. Um, what would happen if you, if you, set, if you, you know, used DX instead? Uh, for the uh, if I use RDX here? Yeah, so uh, the compiler would not produce that character. Uh, the, the compiler will unlike me, not just forget to match the register name to uh, the instruction. Um, I have not tested if you handwrite the assembly, which you can do, and ask GCC to compile it, and you have a mismatch, whether it will fix it for you or not. I'd have to test it. But it's, ex uh, it's extremely rare that we will need to write assembly in practice. Uh, we mostly care about understanding the compiler and understand and looking at assembly to understand the actual operations that the system is doing and how it implements things like procedure calls or arrays or or whatever else. Um, but where compilers are, are are just better at writing assembly than than we're ever going to be. So continuing through our swap example, we move. Uh, parens RDI, so we take hex 120, go to that memory address, find 123 there, and move it into our destination RAX. Then just go to the next line of assembly. Similarly, parens RSI says dereference that pointer, go to address 100 in memory, this RSI has hex 100, and copy 456 to RDX. And now we have just the moves in the other direction, we get the value in RDX, and our destination is one of these uh, memory operands. So we go to address 120 and copy our RDX value to there. And similarly, get the value from RDX, 123, look at the value in RSI, hex 100, go to that address and copy our RDX value to there. And then RET, any theories on what that what that assembly instruction does. Return uh, and return? For yes, it is the return instruction. So you'll note that there's no operand to this RET, this return instruction. And if we, uh, but we're used to seeing return like in C, return and then have a return value after. If we jump back to that register chart, anyone see how we might know what the return value of a uh, procedure is? Exactly. That Rx has this special purpose that a procedure returns, and if the code after the, the return uses a return value from that procedure, it will just use whatever's in RAX. Not some functions might have to be void, they don't return anything, 
they'll still have an RET instruction to kind of send the system back to where it was called. And then this nothing would use the value in RAX uh, because nothing would, would use the return value from a void function. Yes? So what kind of thing would be more than eight bytes? Yeah, so some sort of structure like an array or a struct. Uh, and in C, we always refer to those things via a pointer. So uh, uh, in that case, it will always be returning the address in memory, whatever this is. Yeah. It, does like assembly exist in a multi-threaded system where we would need to worry about trying to access the RAX in but like in between our axis and our right, another function writes over it? Yeah, so multi-threaded that is a, a computer system that has kind of multiple simultaneous things that a single program is doing. Uh, we're going to to uh, talk a lot of that's going to be sort of the focus of the, the last couple weeks of the course, so we'll, we'll talk a lot about that there. Um, if uh, the, the short answer is that uh, each CPU has its own registers, so if we have different parts of a program using multiple CPUs of a system, they have their own registers. If we have a single CPU switching between things, it will be saving the registers to memory with every switch and then restoring them. Other questions? All right. So I want to show you a useful tool when we're thinking about assembly. Uh, and this is a website called godbolt.org. Uh, I think the person that made it is Matthew Godbolt, and just named it after himself. And the neat thing about this is that it lets us write some C code on uh, one side and see the compiled output on the other side. So a couple things that I want to call your attention to with what we're, what we're seeing here. Uh, the first is that kind of each, it shows us kind of how, what each line uh, by, by color, what each line of C code corresponds to in the assembly. Um, do I need all four of these lines in, in C? Is there a way I could uh, shorten this, this C code? Christian. Can you do like multiple assignments in one line? Uh, not unless we want to assign multiple things all to the same value. Okay. Yes, Can you swap the without having the same variable? Yeah, exactly. We don't, we don't need both of our, our local variables here. We maybe could just save uh, T0. Uh, and then just assign XP directly to directly to YP. So I haven't replaced this yet because I would like you to uh, discuss with your neighbors, do you think that making this change to the C code is going to change our uh, assembly for swap. Let's see what, what actually happens. We need a semicolon. No, no change to the assembly at all. Why not? Let me see. Exactly. That we can write a line of C code that says like dereference one pointer equal to dereference another pointer, like assign 
something in one place of memory to another place, but we can't do that in one assembly instruction. So we see that now this, this yellow line here, Godbolt says, corresponds to these two move instructions. This is going to take two move instructions to do this one line of C code. Does that make sense? Questions on this? Yeah. So it won't send me back an error on that, it'll just like fix it and send it automatically? Yeah, the question was, will this send you an error? And uh, the compiler won't because this line three here is perfectly valid C code. Yeah. Um, and it's the compiler's job, if we give it valid C code, to produce assembly that does the same thing, which, which it successfully does in, in this case. Uh, other questions? No. Um, is there like a situation in which we would have to alter our C code for efficiency to account for the fact that there's no memory in memory? Like, it does knowing that there's no memory in memory in the register, uh, should that influence the way we write C? It's an interesting question. Uh, should we take this no memory to memory into account when writing C code? I would expect that in almost every case, this would not have a meaningful impact on performance. Um, the main decision is, do I have something that's stack allocated versus heap allocated? And maybe how many variables am I using simultaneously? But if we look back at our registers, we've got 16 registers. That's it, we don't have any more. And we know that accessing a register is much faster than accessing memory. And if we have more than, than 16 different local variables, well, they can't all be in a register at the same time. So that might matter in, in certain cases. Other questions? So the other thing that I want to point out about uh, what's going on on Godbolt here is this dash O, capital O, G here. And what goes in that box is uh, if you were doing like, if you were doing the command in a terminal like GCC, um, and I say GCC because that's the the compiler. Uh, that you ha I have selected GCC version 9.2. Uh, Bolt has you know many different ones that you could you could explore, uh, and the dash capital O tells the compiler how much optimization it should do. And optimization dash OG says do like a a minimal debugging compatible amount of optimization. And there's dash 01, 02, 03 for different levels of optimization. None of those would make any difference in this tiny function, but they would, uh, we will see how they, how they change code in other circumstances. Thing to be aware of is if I didn't have this OG here, this is compile on not only no optimization, but actually anti-optimization. Because without any, this will this GCC will compile the assembly in such a way so that if you were using a debugger and you just wanted to jump to different lines of C code, just completely skipping lines in between, this version of the assembly, which for every single step moves stuff back and forth between memory, which is why there are so many more assembly steps. It will let you do this like jumping to random lines of C code uh, without necessarily breaking your program. Why you would want to do this, I'm not entirely sure. I'm sure there, there are circumstances where it's useful, uh, but just to uh, be aware that if you are yourself playing on a Godbolt and you're seeing like way more assembly with lots of these um, uh, memory things here, uh, it may be because it's not a, a dash zero G or OG. Uh, something that has, has shown up here that I uh, haven't told you about is this kind of pointer dereference uh, 
operand to an assembly instruction uh, has a sort of uh, expanded form where we can put an offset in front of our register name and this says to our register value and then dereference. So this move here says take the value stored in RBP, add negative 24 to it, and then dereference it. So it's go to memory 24 bytes away from whatever address is in RBP. And so this does not change the value in the register, it just changes what address in memory we look up. Questions on this? Question? No? Oh, no. So our offset and register here is not even the, the full story. We can also give a second register inside the parentheses. And this whole thing does the offset plus the register plus the other register. That whole thing is the address that we're then dereferencing. And this isn't even the final story. We have the final form of our uh, addressing mode. And then we can provide a scale as another uh, uh, argument to our addressing mode. And for this, that scale gets multiplied by this other register. And the value in that register, or how can you multiply by register? Yeah, by the value in that register. So uh, we would get the value in this register. We would add whatever the offset is. It will always be a, a literal number. Why are, and, why are we offsetting at all? So uh, we've talked about how uh, memory is uh, part of our region of memory. We have packing? sorry, is what? Packing it into the uh, no, not quite. So uh, when we talk about the layout of memory, we said there's this region called the stack, and in our registers, we have a special register RSP, which is labeled the stack pointer which just keeps track of where that bottom of the stack is, like where the boundary of the region of memory called the stack. And so we might have this register RSP and be talking about kind of local variables stored on the stack at some distance away from the bottom of the stack. So that's commonly how this offset comes in. I thought you said offset was a literal number. Yeah, so, so we might say, Okay, percent 
RSP is our top of the stack, and we have some local variable that's in memory 16 bytes away from this address. Okay. And you have to write the dollar sign in front. Uh, yes, the, um, uh, the any any literal number we will we will uh, uh, always see. A, sorry, uh, that's that's a lot. When we have a number as part of this uh, addressing mode, we wouldn't see a dollar sign. Dollar sign is when uh, we would have a. Uh, a number uh, on its own is like a separate operand. So we see the dollar sign. I previously had the example of move 10 to our address. So that's, that's when we would have that dollar sign. Who's it? Sorry. Is Max Blood like a Yes, yeah, so lab two will be a, a binary bomb lab. Uh, the, the fiendish uh, uh, Mr. Doctor, the professor, has created a number of, of, uh, of bombs, and each of you will get a, a unique bomb. And these bombs have phases where they require a particular input to diffuse that phase of the bomb. And your mission, which you will have no choice but to accept, is to diffuse, uh, attempt to diffuse all the phases of the bomb. This is an already compiled program, so you won't have the C code. But you will be able to use GDB and other tools to look at the assembly, to step through the assembly line by line, in order to reverse engineer what the diffusing inputs are. So yes, you will use uh, everything we're talking about with assembly in, in the upcoming lab too. All right, let's do a bit of practice with operands. So here's a situation up on the screen. I have some values in registers, some values in memory. And then I have these three operands, which I would like you to uh, take a few minutes and work with your neighbors to figure out what, uh, what value, like if these operands appeared in a move instruction, like what value they would produce, whether that's, uh, which includes like maybe dereferencing, de like going to memory and getting a value there. Uh, this first one, dollar sign hex 108, what, what will that be? That's one of those. Maybe that's just a literal value hex 108. How about this next, this next one, let's start with the address, since we have parentheses tells us this is a, a memory addressing mode. We're going to compute some address and then go find, go find the value again. So what, what address is it going to be? That's going to be 264, which is also x 208. 264 or x108. Anyone else want to uh, walk us through how we get 264? Okay. Um, well, 260 plus uh, the value of RCX, which is for plus register plus offset. Uh, or plus, plus other, sorry. And so it's 260 plus 3 plus 1 for RCX. Yeah, we get 264, which is 256 or 100 in hex plus 8 or 108. And then what, what value do we retrieve from memory? Uh, yeah, 
X13 is, is, the, is the byte at, at 108. I haven't given you a, a, the width of data for these examples, but it really start with the, uh, the byte at, at 108. So we would dereference this and get X13. That's still a little bit confused on the 264. 260 RAX number, and then 100 RX numbers, so how do we add those to get to 264? So we know 260 is in decimal because it doesn't have a zero X in front of it. And so you're right, to add these together, we need to get everything in hex or everything in decimal. So one way would be to, to take our hex one and hex three, turn them into decimal. That's just one and three in, in decimal. As it's, it's in the one these digits are in the ones place. So that's we get two sixty plus one plus three gives us two sixty four. Yeah. So the offset function does the dereferencing, right? You don't need to dereference the after this. Yeah, so the way it does, it does this sort of offset do the dereferencing. Uh, this um, this uh, operand, when we have parentheses around the register, means computer memory address, and then go retrieve the value of memory that dereference that address. Other questions? So if there is something similar in the case, we will want to pull up 0x13, right? For the final last sentence. That's right, yes. Yeah, our, our, the, the, the value there is, is x13. Okay, how about this next one? What address are we, do we compute in this one? X one hundred C. X one hundred and C. Uh, does anyone else explain how how we get X one zero C? It's like if you have the initial value of a hundred and then you're multiplying the second value by the scale. Which the second value is three uh, times four gives you twelve, which then becomes DC. Exactly. We just apply our, our formula for getting the address register plus our other times the scale gives us twelve plus uh, x one hundred. And then what if we dereference this? What does that give us? X11. And then I've added X108 here without the dollar sign, which means uh, go to this address and retrieve the value there. So even though we don't have parentheses around the register, this, which you will almost never see in a compiler generated assembly, uh, is a valid operand. And in this case, would give us uh, X13. Because without the dollar sign, it's preaches as a memory address and dereference that. Okay. We have to use it in the order. Um, things because the one that is in the right. So we might use it as part of a move instruction where we're moving it to some register if we can't do memory to memory. And so this would go to memory address 108, get the value there, and then copy that to whatever the destination is. Yes. I just noticed we're, so we're just dereferencing one byte at a time. That's just always the case. And how would you dereference something longer than one byte? So practicing with these operands, I was, we were only thinking about one byte to keep it simple, but we know it's based on whatever the assembly instruction, it will have one of these four size specifiers that tells you how many bytes you're, you're reading or writing. Other questions?
All right, so our last few minutes, I want to um, introduce some more assembly uh, instructions, which uh, since we kind of have been talking about move and how these different operands work are all, uh, I think, pretty straightforward. We have the add instruction. I'm going to put this kind of underlined after each of these because for each one we supply like Q, W, L, B to tell it how many bytes to read and write. But add gets a source and a destination. And what it does is destination plus source stored in destination. So, for example, we had add Q percent RAX percent RDX. This would have the result of using the, the values from the screen hex 100 plus hex 3 is hex 103, and then it would store hex 103 in RDX, because that's our, our destination. And our, uh, all our kind of binary, um, Binary arithmetic uh, uh, operators work in a similar way. We have subtract, source, destination, which does destination minus the source, store the result in whatever the destination is. Multiplication, destination time source, store destination. And the uh, bitwise operations that we've seen, things like XOR. Or and these all source destination, and we'll do destination XOR source store and destination destination or source. Destination and source store and destination. These specify the bytes. Yeah, all of these would come with the, the size specifier. Does it specify the destination or the, size, or the source? Uh, both. So it tells you how many bytes to read from the source, how many bytes to write to the destination. Yeah, these, the, uh, an individual instruction is never, that's not true. There are, are some that are specifically for converting from like one size of data to another. But all the ones we've talked about, it's... Yeah, what happens if your source and destination are completely different bytes? Uh, so all registers are eight bytes, oh, right. and yeah. we'd only ever kind of read eight bytes at a, at a time. All right, and we're out of time for today. We'll see lots more of assembly uh, to come. Keep working on lab one. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you Monday. <laughs>